Good morning, y'all. It's good to be with you this morning as we're back again to continue our study together through the book of Genesis. I'm excited about our uh, time together this morning. I hope you are. Uh, hope you're continuing to stay with us in Genesis as we look at and continue the rest of our story. Well, this morning we come to the third generation of the descendants of Abraham as we turn our attention to the story of Jacob and Esau. This is one of those familiar stories that we all have heard, we all have grown up hearing about from the time we were kids in Bible class. And we know all about Jacob and Esau and the way that the birthright is stolen and the way the blessing is stolen. And so in some ways, these are familiar stories to us that I think we can be tempted to write off and ignore. But I hope you'll open your Bibles with us this morning. We come to the last part of Genesis 25 and then Genesis 27, as we look at these stories and maybe think about them a little bit differently, as we're reminded through some very powerful lessons about the ways that God still can work to advance his plans, even despite, and perhaps especially despite, our own sin and deception. Because in many ways, deception is really the, the major theme of these Stories of Jacob and Esau. You know how Genesis 25 picks up our story here in verse 27 as we introduce Jacob and Esau. Jacob and Esau might have been twins, but in many regards they were polar opposites. They were very different. It tells us that Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. This idea here of Jacob being a quiet man doesn't mean that he was reserved, but rather it's another way of saying that he was well cultured or civilized. Um, it, it very much indicates two different personalities and demeanors. Personally, this is something I, I understand quite well. Uh, you know, my, my brother, for those of you who, uh, who don't know my brother or haven't heard me talk about it, my brother's a large animal vet. He's got the beard and he's, a, he's an outdoorsman. He's a hunter, all those kinds of things. Me, on the other hand, well, I'm, I'm not those kinds of things. I, I enjoy being outdoors and things like that. I am an Eagle Scout, but, you know, uh, that, that's not me. On the flip side, there's certainly no one who would agree that quiet is an accurate description for me, at least not the way we understand quiet. I'm the furthest thing from that. But certainly, I, I do tend to prefer more of those other kinds of things. I like to think of myself as a well-civilized, well-cultured and civilized kind of individual, much more comfortable in my coats and ties than I am in, a, in a, anything with a camo pattern on it. So I kind of get this description of Jacob and Esau as two very different individuals. Um, but that's not the problem here. The problem isn't that Jacob and Esau were different. The problem is found in verse 28 where we begin to see the problems emerge. Verse 28 here tells us that Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. The parents played favorites, and that is going to place strain and tension on the relationships in this family, both in the relationship between Rebekah and Isaac and between, in the, and between the relationship of Jacob and Esau. There's going to be strain and tension in this relationship and in this family. And that's a major problem. Now, it's not one that's soon to go away. We know that Jacob is going to have the same problems as the father because Jacob is going to have a favorite. He's going to have a favorite son in the form of Joseph. And well, we'll talk about all the ways that that favoritism affects the, his family in a few weeks. But from there, we come to 20, verse 29, Genesis 25, verse 29. And it's a story you're all familiar with. It's the story of Jacob stealing Esau's birthright or perhaps Esau selling the birthright. It's not necessarily thievery, but it's deceptive and manipulative to say the least. Well, Esau had been out hunting. Jacob was inside. He was cooking up this red stew. And Esau had been out hunting, and it says that he comes in and asks for a bite of the, asks for some soup. He says, let me eat some of that red stew, for I am exhausted. 
The word exhausted here is the same word that is used to talk about soldiers who have just returned from battle. Esau is beyond famished. He is at a point desperate for some food. He is hungry and his body is aching and you can just kind of feel this sense of desperation. Well, Jacob, rather than showing hospitality like his grandfather Abraham had done, sees an opportunity to get something from his brother that he wanted, the birthright. And so he says, I'll give you some of this stew, Esau, but it's going to cost you your birthright. And Esau says, I'm starving, I'm hungry, I'm exhausted. Give me the soup. Take the birthright. What does it matter if I die right now? And Jacob wants to make sure that this isn't rash, so he says, swear to me. And Esau swears to him. And from there, the narrative wraps up rather quickly. Jacob gave Esau the bread and the stew, and he ate and he drank and he rose and went on his way, seemingly thinking no more of it. But verse 34 ends with these words. Thus Esau despised his birthright. This is a significant and major sentence in this narrative. When we think about the things we have encountered in Genesis so far, we've seen some pretty big sins, some pretty big problems in the lives of faithful individuals. Noah was drunk. We have the lying and deception of Abraham and Isaac on several occasions. We have the incestuous relationship with, of Lot. We have all of these different problems that come up in the lives of people who should be and who are people of God. And not a single time do we see the text explicitly condemn those actions through a written condemnation. In fact, this type of written and moral condemnation in Scripture by the narrator is very rare, but we see it here. And that should tell us something serious and substantial about the nature of what has just happened here. This is not a small problem. This is not a small or insignificant thing. The birthright was a big deal. In the ancient Near Eastern society, the birthright entailed at least, at the minimum, a double portion of the inheritance. So let's say a father has five sons. Well, that would mean that of those five sons, an extra portion is added to the inheritance. So now there are six portions of inheritance. The oldest would receive two plots and the other four sons would receive one each. In the case of Jacob and Esau then, that means that Esau was entitled to at least two-thirds of all that his father had. Two-thirds of the inheritance. That is a substantial blessing. Furthermore, that's, it. that's the very minimum. Sometimes the inheritance went entirely to the oldest by virtue of the birthright. We saw that play out with Isaac, and while we've already talked about how Isaac was not actually the oldest, Isaac is the only one who receives any of the inheritance of Abraham. So in this we see something very significant that Esau casts aside his birthright which was an incredibly valuable, really an invaluable blessing to him as by virtue of being the oldest son. He tosses it aside in exchange for a bowl of soup. That's the prayer. The audience reading this in the days of Moses would have recoiled in horror, understanding exactly what it meant that Esau had, had sold his birthright. Maybe we don't fully understand that today, but I want you to think about this as a major blessing for the rest of his life and for his children. He, was, he had a God-given by birth right to these blessings. And he tosses the long-term blessing aside for one bowl of soup. We'll pick up that at the end of our time together this morning. And so with that, chapter 25 comes to a close. Now, we move on then to chapter 27. 
And by this point, we're probably about another, oh, 50, 60 years down the road by the time we get to chapter 27. Isaac at this point is somewhere around, we believe, 137 years old. He's getting old and blind and he says, it's time to get my affairs in order. It's time to get my house in order to settle the scores, to divide up my land, to make the blessings of my children. He calls in his son Esau and he says, son, I am old and I do not know the day of my death. Now, we know that Isaac's going to live sometime longer uh, into the days of Joseph even before he dies. But here he is, he's an old man. He's beginning to lose his eyesight. And he doesn't know how much time he's got left. So he says, I need to get things in order now before it's too late. So he's ready to bless Isaac, or to bless Esau. Isaac calls in his oldest son to bless him. At the moment of blessing, clan leadership moved to the son. This was a big deal. This was an important and significant moment in the life of a family when the father blessed the son and said, this is your family now, my son. Lead. Go. You are in charge. This is a very big thing. This was normally a very public ceremony. But notice that Isaac didn't set it up that way. Isaac calls just Esau in. He says, I want you to go out on the hunt and kill some game and prepare that stew for me just the way you know I like it. And then bring it to me and when you do, I'm going to bless you, Esau. We oftentimes make Isaac the, the victim in this story because he's the subject and the victim of the deception at the hands of Rebecca and Jacob. And certainly he is. But let's not let Isaac off the hook too strongly here. We don't know why Isaac chose to make this ceremony private. Maybe it was he knew and understood and remembered the, prompt, the words of God, the oracle of God that said the oldest would serve the youngest. Maybe he's trying to get around that. I don't know. We can't say that for sure. Maybe he didn't want Rebecca and Jacob to know, afraid that they would try to keep it from happening because he knew the favoritism that Rebecca had toward Jacob. Whatever the case is, Isaac is taking that which is normally very public and making it private. It certainly seems that he has something he's trying to hide in this because he understands the significance of what he's about to do. Something just seems off here within the cultural practice of the day. Well, despite Isaac's best efforts to keep this ceremony very private, Rebecca heard his words. Rebecca was presumably outside the tent. And she heard what Isaac was about to do, so she calls her favorite son. She calls Jacob and she says, Jacob, your father's about to bless your brother. And he told him to go on the hunt and to kill an animal and bring it back and prepare a stew. So here's what I want you to do, Jacob. I am commanding you, my child, go and kill a couple of goats from our flock and bring them to me, and I'm going to prepare a stew, and then you're going to go into your father and pretend to be your brother Esau, and you are going to get the blessing. And Jacob says, now hold on a second, Mom. My brother Esau is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. Father's going to know I'm not Esau. And then when he does, he's going to know that I'm, that I'm mocking him. He's going to know I'm trying to steal this blessing. And instead of blessing me, he's going to curse me. And Rebecca says, do not worry about the curse. The curse of, if he curses you, that'll be on me, not on you. You go do these things. And when you do it, I'm going to have you kill the goat. After you kill the goat, I want you to take the skin of the goat and put it on your hands and put it on the back of your neck. And then when your father goes to feel you, you know he can't see really well, but he will feel you and he will know that you are your brother Esau. There is deception at every stage of this. Jacob clearly knew that what he was doing was wrong. That's why in verse 12 he was concerned about being cursed rather than blessed. But Jacob goes through with it anyway. Seeking this blessing from Isaac by fraud was the exact opposite of living by faith. On Wednesday nights, we've been talking about what it looks like to live by faith. 
On Sunday mornings, we've been looking at what it looks like to live by faith through the lives of Abraham and Isaac. And here we have Jacob, and he is certainly not very concerned about living by faith because he is acting morally reprehensible here. His actions are wrong and sinful and deceptive, and there's no getting around it. Jacob is not acting by faith. But then again, neither is Rebecca. And in many ways, Rebecca deserves the lion's share of the blame here. She's the one who commands her son to do these things. She's the one who listens in on Isaac. She's the one who concocts the plan. She's the one who figures out the way to ensure that, that the plan is not, that is not discovered, that the deception is complete, and that the blessing occurs. There is clear evidence that what that they knew what they were doing was wrong and deceptive, and they did it anyway. But in many regards, this isn't much of a surprise. Because as Isaac goes into his father there in verse 20, or as Jacob rather goes there into his father there in verse 20, Isaac says, hold on now. It hadn't been long enough for you to go and go on a hunt and then have time to kill it and cook it and bring it back to me. Something isn't adding up here. How is this that you've done all these things? And Jacob says, the Lord your God granted me success. He uses the name of God, Yahweh, your God. Jacob doesn't make any claim that it is his God. In fact, we're going to see Jacob use this phrase, the Lord your God, three more times in the book of Genesis. It's only after he wrestles with God and his name is changed to Israel that Jacob will begin to call him my God. Jacob's spiritual state is not very good at this point in the narrative. And so Isaac says, well, come closer to me and, and, and bring the food. And he hears him and he says, You're, you sound like Jacob. But he puts his hand on Jacob's hand and he puts his hand on Jacob's neck and he feels the hair and Jacob is wearing Esau's clothes and he smells like his brother Esau and he feels like his brother Esau. And the soup tastes good because Rebecca, remember, had cooked it. She'd been cooking for Isaac for 70 years, or for more years than that, for uh, nearly 100 years by this point. She knows how he likes his stew and his beet and his bread. And so, convinced that perhaps he's just hearing things wrong, Isaac begins to bless his son believing that he is blessing Esau, but actually blessing Jacob. This blessing included a blessing for fertility and dominion. It was the type of blessing you gave to the older son that, incurred, that spoke to being blessed by God that his brothers would serve him, that he would have dominion and power and control over the peoples and nations of, that he encountered. That he would be blessed with many children and descendants of his own. And he ends it there in verse 29 with these words, Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be everyone who blesses you. Taking us back to the promise of God to Abraham so many years before. And with that, Jacob receives the blessing of his father Isaac. The blessing would have gone and should have gone to his brother Esau. Well, verse 30 here of chapter 27 tells us that as soon as Jacob had finished, Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, Jacob had scarcely gotten out of the presence of his father when Esau returned from hunting. And he prepared the food and he went into his father. And in that moment, Isaac and Esau realized what had happened. Esau was angry and devastated. He asked, Father, is there not anything you can bless me with? And Isaac says, Son, I, I'm so sorry. But no. Your brother Jacob got the blessing. I can give you a blessing, but it's not the blessing you would have gotten. It's not the blessing that should have been yours.
And he, Isaac says to him there in verse 37, Behold, I have made him Lord over you, and all his brothers I have given to him for service. And with grain and wine I have sustained him. What then can I do for you, my son? He says, I've given this blessing. In the ancient Near Eastern world, blessings were not something that could be easily taken away. Once Isaac blessed Jacob, his word meant something. That blessing mattered. They could not just be revoked because of the deception. And in doing so, Esau was left with a blessing that said he would indeed serve his brother before eventually breaking free. And that we know will happen. The Edomites will indeed eventually rebel from the line of Judah. But as you might imagine, when all this is over, Esau was furious. He was so mad that he was at the point of Cain ready to kill his brother. And Rebecca knew this, and so she sends Jacob away. She sends him to the land of her bro- of, uh, to the land of her brother Laban, and she says, "Go, get away, get out of here. I cannot let see you die." And chapter twenty seven comes to a close, just like that. But all of this reminds us of a couple of important things. The first thing that we need to be reminded of is that God is working to bring about His will. His grace is greater than our sin. And God is working to achieve purposes bigger than us. Jacob and Rebekah acted by deception and treachery. And through it all, God still worked to bring about His promise. God had told them when the boys were still in their mother's womb that the younger son would be Lord over the older son. And God brought that about even through deception. God is working in our weakness to still bring about His purposes. Perhaps God is working especially despite our weaknesses to bring about His purposes Just because we mess up does not mean that God cannot turn our sins and our failures into things that ultimately lead to the greater good and the greater advancement of His mission and His purpose and His kingdom. He did it despite the sin and deception of Jacob and He can do it despite our sins because God's will and God's grace are bigger than our failures. And folks, that's good news. But I think these stories also remind us of an important cautionary tale in the legacy of Esau. And we alluded to this a little bit earlier. Esau gave up the greater blessing in the future for that which brought him pleasure and gratification in the moment. I'm not trying to downplay Esau's hunger here. But Esau surrendered his birthright for a bowl of lentils and some bread. Y'all, I've had some really good beans and cornbread in my life. And I'm a mighty big fan of beans and cornbread. But I ain't willing to trade my soul and to trade the blessings of God for a bowl of beans and cornbread no matter how good it is. But I want us to not just dwell on the particulars of this. Because I think the lesson for us is a little bigger. James warns us of the dangers of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. He talks about those being the things of this world. But isn't that what sin is? Us getting caught up in that which brings us pleasure in the here and now because we choose to focus on our current and the immediate pleasure that we get in sin without regard for what it means we we could be surrendering in the greater blessings of God.
Is 30 seconds of pleasure now really worth throwing away all the blessings that are found in Christ? Is our instant gratification worth surrendering the greater blessings found in God? Because if we're not careful, it can quickly be not just one moment of instant gratification, but a life of us living by what makes us feel good without any regard for living lives that lead to eternal blessing in Christ Jesus. What kind of lives are we living? What kind of people are we? What kind of decisions are we making? The tale of Esau reminds us that we need to be careful not to be people who exchange the blessings of Christ for that which makes us feel good right now. As we think about Genesis 25 and 27, these stories of Jacob and Esau, they're a little different than some of those we've looked at in the last few weeks. They're not, this story isn't filled with an example of how to live. If anything, it's filled with examples of how not to live, of what not to do. But maybe that's the point. Maybe what we see in the deception and the trickery and the thievery and the scheming and the, and the sins of Genesis 25 and 27 are a reminder that this is not what it looks like to live by faith. But I think it also reminds us that even in our moments of weakness, that God can still take our failures and achieve His purposes. That His grace is bigger than our sin. That His will is greater than our desires. That He wants us to go where He wants us to go more than we want to go where He wants us to go. And that He is working to bring about good. That He is working to bring about His glory and His kingdom and His plans. And He can even turn our sins and our weaknesses and our failures into things that bring about his plans. May we be people who strive to live lives that glorify God. But may we be comforted in our failures to know that, he is, that His grace is greater than our sin. And may we be people who choose not to live for our own selfish desires but who are constantly reminded of the greater blessings that lay in store for us as heirs to the promise of Abraham and children 